Did you ever have one of these when you were little? Your favorite toy, your favorite teddy, that you used to love to death, and you'd take everywhere. And you would ask it the burning questions of your young life. Teddy, will I be a Jedi Knight when I grow old? <laughs> and you would hear Teddy's imaginary voice at the back of your head saying, patient you must be, young Padwan. <laughs> patient you must be. Well, what if I told you that now toys can listen, understand, remember, and respond to everything that we say? Science fiction? Something out of Toy Story? Well, this is the here and now. Let's say hi to Hello Barbie. Well, we are on stage to show all these lovely people how amazing you are, Barbie. Being on stage is exciting, isn't it? Yes, I love it. That's cool. I didn't know that about you. I like to be on stage, too. So she can recognize and respond, so she understands, but she can also remember. So she's going to get to know all my likes, all my dislikes, and then she will incorporate that into our conversation. Barbie, what should I be when I grow up? Well, you told me you like being on stage, so maybe a dancer? Or a politician? Or how about a dancing politician? I always say, anything is possible. Indeed, Barbie, indeed. <laughs> that uh, video excerpt is from the New York Toy Fair in February 2015, which unveiled Hello Barbie for the first time. And this is how Hello Barbie works. You press a button, that activates a sensor. The sensor records what the child says and anything else that's happening in the background. That recording is then converted into an audio file, and it's beamed from Barbie by wireless into the cloud. The file is then converted into an, automatically into a text file, and that text file is subjected to data analysis by an algorithm. The algorithm then chooses an appropriate response based on what the child has been saying, and the response then gets beamed back down to Barbie. All in seamless time, as you can see. At present, there's only a, a number of scripted responses, and all the scripted responses are created by humans. But the makers of Barbie are saying that it's going to be thousands upon thousands of responses. Two hours worth of conversation between children and the toy. And this is the kind of development that my colleague Mark Andreevich and I were really interested in. The sensorization, the use of sensors in everyday devices and objects. And when we started our research, we started to see these amazing technological developments. A sensorized carpet for use in aged care facilities that can predict when a patient is likely to fall. A sensorized nappy that sends a tweet to parents to let the parents know the nappy's wet and needs to be changed. And when we started looking at these developments, we started to think about our foundational notions of privacy in a different way. And we started to conclude that we're on the cusp of a different society a very different society, the Sensor Society. And the Sensor Society is about bringing together four currently disconnected elements of rapid technological development that's silently taking over our devices and our everyday objects. And it all starts, as you've probably guessed, with sensors. The sensorization of everyday devices and the best example of these devices you have in your pockets and you have in your handbags, the smartphone. The smartphone is packed with up to a dozen sensors. Sensors that detect motion and movement. Sensors that detect force and touch. Sensors that detect direction, light, and even location in the form of GPS and wireless access cards. And the use of these sensors are changing how we use our devices and our objects. So your smartphone can now be used as a pedometer. It can even work out when you're walking or running. It can be used as a barometer. It can be used as a heart rate monitor. And it's not even the individual positive benefits that's coming out of the use of these sensorized devices. Your smartphone can now be used collectively as new networks. So the sensors in your smartphone are so sensitive that if you have them on a table and they shake, they can be used as an earthquake detection network at a fraction of the cost of these networks. 
These sensors are creating enormous amounts of information. IBM has estimated that 90% of all of the data created and stored by all of human society has been created in the last two years. Every day, Facebook alone creates the data equivalent of 50 libraries of Congress. We're making more data than we know what to do with, and much of this data is coming from sensors. So the fact that you're sitting in this room now, your mobile phone, your smartphone, is broadcasting data of the fact that you're sitting here. And the fact that we're getting these sensors and data together means we can now do different things again with our phones, with our objects of everyday life. So our smartphone can now be used to infer our mood by the way we type our text messages or the amount of phone calls that we make or how we touch our phone, whether we touch it with a bit of force or whether we're nice and gentle with it. All of that can be used to infer our mood. How do we make sense of these mountains of data? Welcome to the rhetoric and the actuality of the big data world. Big data is used as the justification for making sense of these mountains of data. That if we get all of this data together, we can then mine it. And we can mine it to make unexpected and uh, previously unanticipated insights and uses of data that we would have never before seen. These insights, they require a different data collection logic. We have to collect everything. We have to keep it forever because we simply don't know what data is going to be irrelevant or relevant. Because even irrelevant data, completely irrelevant data, can someday be relevant. Take, for example, this situation, which emphasizes that we're starting to get some very different decision-making processes being taken place. A US data analysis firm that specializes in recruitment looked at the online job applications of 30,000 applicants, some 3 million separate points of data. This firm identified from the job application process who, which applicants would be innovative applicants and who would stay with the companies longer. So you may be thinking, oh, well, that was obviously based on the application itself. No. It was based on which browser the applicant used to upload the application. Your application may lo no longer matter. It may now be your browser that actually gets you the job that you want. All of this is held together by enormous invisible infrastructures. It's the infrastructures that holds the sensors, the data, and the analytics together. And when we think of infrastructure, we think of infrastructure as being something solid and monolithic. In the sensor society, infrastructure has this malleable duality. It can change. So a wireless network can be used as a data collection network. And as the Edward Snowden documents show, a telecommunications network can be used as an infrastructure of mass surveillance. So the Sensor Society is about identifying these hidden technological processes of collection, of storage, and of use. And it's requiring us to fundamentally rethink the application, the foundational application of privacy law. So let's go there now. Traditionally, privacy law protects things that are private to us where we have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Private spaces such as our homes, our bedrooms, private places such as the inviolability of our body, that we have this zone of protections around our bodies. Private thoughts, that we have space to think what we want so we can develop as human beings without interference. And private communications and private information, the personal information, information about us that we need to proceed in our daily lives that describes who we are and what we are. The sense of society 
is fundamentally challenging these private spaces and places. They're being invaded by sensorized devices. So when you bring the smartphone into your house, when you bring a doll with a sensor into your child's bedroom, you're not just bringing a doll into the bedroom, you're bringing in a massive invisible set of infrastructures that's used to collect data on a 24-7 basis. And that data gets used in ways that we can't possibly imagine. Now, I'm not saying in all this that we're facing the death of privacy. This isn't about the death of privacy. Privacy is important to us and will always be important to us. We need it in our daily lives. This is about something different. This is about thinking about the consequences of a rapidly developing technological society in which the lens of privacy doesn't encapsulate the complexity of that society. So let's go back and let's think about Hello Barbie in relation to the complexity of this society. In one sense, the issues in relation to Hello Barbie are the classic privacy issues. As privacy advocates screamed about in February when Hello Barbie was first unveiled. It's about the invasion of these public spaces. It's about the invasion of private thoughts, of shaping our thoughts, and it's about collections of personal information. And the makers of Hello Barbie acknowledge this. So when Barbie beams the recordings into the cloud, those beams are encrypted. Sorry, those recordings are encrypted. They're held in secure databases. Parents have access to the recordings and can delete the recordings at any time. And the company that makes Hello Barbie are committed to only using those recordings for the purpose of the algorithms. So there'll be no targeted marketing to children or to parents based on what kids are saying. But what about this situation? What about the situation where a child, a girl, picks up Barbie, presses the button, and says this, Barbie, I don't like the way my daddy touches me. I want him to stop, but I'm scared. What do I do? What does Barbie do? Does she just not respond? We'll stick that one in the too hard basket, or we'll rattle out some rubbish about being a dancing politician. Or, or does the executive who, who is behind Barbie, who has control of Barbie, make the decision that something has to be done? So we have the situation where an American executive is making decisions about potential issues of child abuse in Australia, France, Germany, or wherever. Or do the toy makers develop a scripted response? that they factor in these situations and deliver a scripted response to children. Can you get a scripted response for something so individualized and devastatingly human? Or, and what's the role of the algorithm here? Does the algorithm look at patterns, look at keywords to identify children who are potentially in danger? Or even more than that, does the algorithm predict when children could potentially be in danger? Do we move to the world of the minority report? And what's the role of law enforcement here? Should law enforcement get access to these recordings? Or should they have access, back-end access, to these types of databases? I don't know the answers to these questions, but these are th questions indicate that we have to respond in a different way that's be above and beyond privacy. These are questions of the how. How do we respond? How do we be good citizens? How do we make good decisions? That are profoundly ethical questions. How do we make good decisions in a society that's too complex for us to understand? And we're not meant to understand, because that society won't function if we understand its basis. And it's not just the questions of how, it's the questions of who. Who's in control? Who owns the infrastructures? Who makes the decisions? 
So it's not just ethical questions, it's questions of power. And these are the issues that we need to resolve and think about as we move into this world, to try and work out what are the positives and what are the negatives of this increasingly censorized society. Because there are positives, but there are also negatives. And this is the fundamental question that Mark and I think that we need to think about. Are we going to be the collected, where we're passive in terms of data collection? We don't know that data collection is taking place. We have absolutely no idea what our data is going to be used for. Or that we're divided into segmented groups, buckets as Google calls them. And decisions are made about our lives in relation to which bucket we're put in. And we have no idea what bucket we've been put in or why we've been put in a bucket. Or do we be the collective, where we can harness the new capabilities of sensorized devices and objects to better understand our world and to be thoroughly and actively involved in the ethical and democratic development of the sensor society? These are the fundamental issues that we need to resolve. And it's clear from Hello Barbie that these aren't issues from the future. These are issues for the here and for the now. Thank you.